I'm delighted that Kerry and I are going to um, be uh, doing this session around museums, health and wellbeing, using collections and capturing evidence. Um, I'm particularly interested in this because it's slightly unusual for us because we're very used to sharing the findings from projects with, with people um, and that's partly what this session's about but it's actually also about the beginning of a project as well which is why we're really interested in the discussion and having time um, at the end of this session to have some discussion and to get your ideas and to stimulate new ways of thinking really so we're really keen to get your engagement with this so I'm going to hand over to Kerry who's going to begin. Okay, we're going to look at um, three projects today um, around health and wellbeing, which is becoming quite a significant strand for RCMG research. Um, just to give you some background into RCMG, if you're not familiar with our work, we're the Research Centre of Museums and Galleries, um, based in the School of Museum Studies. We were established in 1999 by Eileen Hooper Greenhill in response to um, um, a Commonwealth Museums and Learning in the United Kingdom, which was a really highly influential report. Um, stressing that museum education could be developed in museums and one of the ways in which it could be developed was to create a research centre that would develop innovative and cutting edge research around education and how that could be advanced in museums. Um, so RCMG was established to achieve that. Um, some of the projects we've worked on around learning, developing the generic learning outcomes, um, big projects around representation of disabled people and disability in museums, and now we're looking at health and wellbeing as a significant strand of our research impact. Um, um, we are, all our research is framed by our mission and our values. Um, our vision is to carry out research that can inform and enrich creative museum thinking, policy and practice, to support museums to become more dynamic and socially purposeful institutions. And this is really important, the develop, development of museums that are socially impactful, um, serve their community needs, and develop innovative ways of doing that as well. And that's one thing we wanted to look at in health and wellbeing research. So museums, health and wellbeing. There's a real growing, um, credible body of evidence um, increasingly that museums and galleries can have a very significant and valuable impact on the um, health and well-being of both individuals and communities. There's lots of inspiring work taking place in museums and I just want to go through some of the ways in which museums and galleries can support health and well-being. So in terms of what health and well-being is, these are both very complex terms and they are defined in a number of different ways. But one of the most useful um, definitions we found of well-being is that developed by the New Economics Foundation. So this sees well-being as a dynamic process that gives people a sense of how their lives are going through the interaction between their circumstances, activities and psychological resources. So to explain that a little bit more, for the New Economics Foundation, well-being is made up of two elements, feeling good and functioning well. So feeling good includes feelings of happiness, contentment, enjoying yourself, curiosity, but also engagement in the world around you, feeling interested and curious to find out more, and also interest in yourself and how you feel towards other things around you. Functioning well is much more about the experience of positive relationships, so sharing things with people, um, connecting to people and also learning from them but also having control over your, your life, a sense of autonomy, and also a sense of purpose and meaning in what you do. So in terms of the policy context for museums, the Museums Association is really backing the importance of, of health and wellbeing within its um, vision for the impact of museums. This is Museums Change Lives, which was recently published. It creates a strong policy framework for this work and stresses the importance of museums engaging with health and wellbeing agendas. So some of the evidence is that museums boost people's quality of life and improve mental and physical health. Also the social aspect of taking part in activities in museums with other people is important to positive wellbeing. So this is a, a really nice quote that Jocelyn often uses in her presentations around health and wellbeing. It stresses that the language of science alone is insufficient to describe health. The language of story, myth and poetry also disclose its truth. So it's trying to get away from this idea that health and wellbeing issues can all be resolved by medical institutions, by going to the doctor, by going to the hospital. There's a sense that health and wellbeing is also about your place in the world and how you interact with that world, which again is stressed in the, the NEF definition of wellbeing. 
And also, this quote really helps to put museums in the frame. How can museums help disclose this truth around health and well-being? What can they do to help promote positive activity and positive ideas about health and well-being in our everyday lives? So the question is, how can museums improve and enhance our health and well-being? Um, from the evidence, there's this real gathering collection of evidence that the objects are really important. They have a real power in helping people to think about themselves and the world around them. It's not really well understood at the moment, but there's something about the tactile qualities of objects, about touching them, about talking to people about objects and engaging with them in very deep and meaningful ways that can help people to feel much better about themselves, to connect their bodies and minds, to stimulate their senses, to act as a trigger for thoughts, feelings, ideas and new ways of thinking. And because we learn so much from objects as well, one of the routes to positive well-being is, is thought to be keeping learning and thinking about the world and not getting stuck in, in ways of thinking that are negative for us. Also, museums can help make sense of our lives. And for people who have challenging health and well-being issues, that can be one way to put it into perspective, but also to learn more about how other people feel about their health and well-being. Um, but the Royal Society for Public Health suggests a role for museums and galleries to help build emotional resilience, morale and coping skills, strengthening identity and social inclusion as well, which can help communities. Um, yeah, I want to um, talk about something which dates back in my pro both my professional career but personally as well. And if you look at um, this image here, you can see this is from Nottingham Museums where I worked. Um, uh, Richard was working there at the same time, so uh, it was an interesting time. 1994, so it's, it's over 20 years ago. And this was an exhibition um, and part of a programme, a series of activities that were focused around health and wellbeing that we were working on. But this one had particular significance and resonance later for me. So... Um, the exhibition was called Our Bodies, Ourselves. It was at the Castle Museum, which had special funding from the Arts Council, so it had a lot of contemporary art. So we were always using artists to explore issues um, and to uh, investigate a whole variety of things. So there was a very strong link between my role then, which was head of education and um, communities, uh, with the, the, sort of, uh, the agenda of the exhibition programme there as well. In this exhibition, In Our Bodies Ourselves, it featured bold and explicit and uncompromising photos capturing the, radical, uh, the reality of radical breast surgery. One of the photos was self, a number of the photos were by the artist Jo Spence, where she explored her personal journey as breast cancer shaped her life. The photos present the effect of lumpectomies and full mastectomies, while the artist's face stares out at the viewer. The photographs pull no punches, they're not clinical, they're not abstract, they present the realities of the disease, a reality which one in six people will experience when they're diagnosed with some kind of cancer. One in, th sorry, one in eight who may be diagnosed with breast cancer or one in three with some form of cancer. At the time of the exhibition, I found the images to be incredibly powerful. They gave real insights. Um, that are widely experienced by people but are so often hidden, understated, superficially made good by prosthetics and reconstructive surgery. A museum seems an unlikely place to embark on a journey of understanding a medical condition, but it was back to those images of Joe Spence that I returned some years later when my mum was diagnosed with breast cancer. My mum's experiences of illness was not of an abstract disease. Though much of her time was spent in hospitals, having surgery, radiotherapy, hopeful checkups, and debilitating chemotherapy. Her ill health was not simply a medical condition. It was an explicitly part of her, a complex mixture of emotions and experiences, part of her life, of her death, and our loss. But it was in the museum that I experienced the courageous, educative, thought-provoking public images displaying the savageries of breast cancer surgery. I could see the really bold role, bold role that art can play in helping people to see the universality of disease and ill health. 
to open dialogues, fears, embarrassments, all realities facing the dreads and fears of breast cancer. So for me, that was a, a very, very particular experience, which was very, very significant, um, and one which I think was hugely important. And I, I look to people like Jo Spence as being immensely courageous in, in uh, showing her journey and her experiences, which I think are still very much frowned upon. People aren't open enough about it. What am I doing wrong? Is it the top one? Yeah, it's the top one, yeah. Okay, so I'll move on while we're getting the next image. Not working. I'll just go for it. So um, it, it's not only about those personal aspects, but it's also the way in which museums can be used to stimulate memory as well. Museums are really excellent at reminiscence. They have a wealth of collections which stimulate memory. And in some ways, it's often the default setting for many museums. So this is a very established area of practice in museums with some really good examples, specialists like Age Exchange, which use museums to stimulate memory in a whole range of different ways. And there have been particular... Um, really insightful programmes like Liv National Museums Liverpool's House of Memories project um, led by Carol Rogers which has been visionary in its approach um, to create an innovative way of working with people with dementia and with those people associated with them. Um, it's a really ambitious project and it locates the museum at the centre of the issue um, for those people whose lives are absolutely shaped by dementia. House of Memories uses museum collections to stimulate uh, the, and value people's memories and to enable greater understanding of the value of, of people's histories and experiences. And it has all sorts of different dimensions to it. So it has interactive training, it has practical resources, it has free loan services, it has a digital app, and it's being franchised in the US. Um, it's being used by funded through the NHS. Um, it's re a really interesting programme which has, has reached and touched a vast number of people's lives. Okay, so... No? Can we have the next one? I know, I'm trying to use it now. Um, so let's think in terms of what opportunities there are for museums. Well, the, the Royal Society for Public Health in 2013 really could see and understand the way in which the arts, which have been doing work around this area for many, many years, but perhaps it's at a different stage where the health sector itself is beginning to understand it doesn't have the answer to all ills, that it's no longer sustainable to think how we are going to um, sustain the level of care that we have, certainly in a UK context, but also globally, to be able to support people in the way in which we have. So the sort of very medicalised view of health and wellbeing is being challenged and being acknowledged by the public health sector as well. And they can see the possibilities that um, arts and health um, have and that the relationship that culture has in providing a very valuable role. So let's have a look. Uh, I want to have a look at a project, Mind, Body, Spirit. Um, we've got some publications here from this project. So if you'd, there aren't enough for everybody, but if you'd like to uh, have a look at those and uh, repeat whatever. Um, Mind, Body, Spirit really sets the context for RCMG's work around health and wellbeing, demonstrating a really compelling role for museums in the way in which they can enhance individual and community well-being. Um, the project was funded through the Arts Council. It was a one-year project. It was a, a group of a network of museums in the East Midlands and we worked with uh, a variety of different organisations um, but also we paired up museums with various health and social care agencies as well. So really interesting collaboration and really interesting partnerships. Next one, please. Okay, so what did we learn from Mind, Body and Spirit? Well, I think there were three areas that were particularly significant for this. 
The first was understanding a community need, and that's easier said than done. And navigating your way through the amount of material and data that's available in relation to health and wellbeing is absolutely vast. It's enormous, vast quantities of data. Um, but finding out local priorities is especially important. And in the last few years, there's been a devolution of that to a local level. So local authorities are much more engaged in that. So in fact, that material is much more readily available in an um, easier way to find as well. So that's really significant, really important. The second thing is thinking about museum collections and thinking differently and creatively about them. I mentioned the idea that museums are really good at memory and it's often been this sense that museums default to particular ways of doing things. So they think of, um, uh, you know, thinking about uh, the way in which you may, for instance, work with older people, that all older people will want to do something about memory. You know, and that's part of their experience, but not all of their experience. So it's thinking about how you might use collections in new and different ways. But the other critical part to this is thinking about the partnerships. And as with any project of this kind, the partnerships are absolutely critical, working with people who have got a clear understanding of the needs of organisations that are engaged with health and wellbeing. So they're very much involved with community need. Um, but can understand the value that culture can bring. Um, we worked with a service manager from Derbyshire County Council, for instance, who didn't always have the vocabulary to understand the cultural experience, but she understood what it meant. And she said how, for instance, um, people might be able to use objects to talk about things that were very, very difficult for them. So instead of talking about themselves, they could talk through an object. And I thought that was a very powerful way to think how you need to have partners who can understand and see the possibilities. So we worked in Leicester, for instance, with the hospital school here, with the then very charismatic head teacher here who had uh, very interesting, uh, huge ambitions about the way in which his young people should be entitled to um, experiences, cultural experiences, despite the fact that some of them were incredibly ill, very, very vulnerable young people. Next one, please. What was also very important has, and has been really significant for us in this has been um, using the New Economics Foundation's Five Ways to Wellbeing. And Kerry mentioned a little bit about the work that the New Economics Foundation have done. Um, and they have been really significant in shaping a lot of this work around understanding what wellbeing means. And they developed a framework called the Five Ways to Wellbeing, which... Um, I was talking to my dad recently, who's in his late 80s, and he said he'd been to the University of the Third Age. I'm sure some of you will know about that. And he said we had somebody talking about happiness. And I said, was it the five ways to well-being? So sent him one of these. And, of course, he was saying all the things about it, about connecting, about being active, about taking notice of keeping learning and giving. And actually, I said to him, we've just got funding for a project, and you, you've been the inspiration behind it. And he's going, what? What are you talking about? But actually, he does demonstrate these things and how significant they are in terms of... Um, Despite being old, he's absolutely connected with the world today and engaged with it. He's active, he's not as physically active as he could used to be, but he's active mentally and he does as much as he possibly can. So it's not about what you can't do, it's about what you can do. And it's also about that connection of having connections with people and having a sort of stake in the world, really. So being active. Next, please is hugely important and one of the things that we tried to work out with um, Mind, Body, Spirit was to experiment with the idea of seeing if we could use collections to see if we could get older people to be um, actively engaged and if we could use objects to do that. And we did that in a number of places, in Derbyshire, in Lincolnshire, in Northamptonshire. There are a variety of experiments, I think with varying degrees of success. I would say I'd be quite critical of them really because I think the default setting was to go back to memory and I think that was um, it's happened uh, too often for my liking really that we weren't able to create a framework where we could intrigue people enough 
but there's a lovely uh, project in Lincolnshire, one of the volunteer museums there, <coughs> um, mm. which had a beautiful chest of drawers, and they drew, uh, uh, you know, just opened the drawers, and it was this sense of discovery, of sort of selecting om- objects, of having an opinion about them, of finding something intriguing. And uh, I went to see one of these sessions in a village hall, Willing- Willingham Village Hall in the depths of Lincolnshire, and one of the women that was involved in the session was saying, I'm going to go and put something together like this for my grandchildren. And you could just see she'd got all sorts of ideas of what she was going to do. And it was that idea of connection. And there was a very funny uh, lady in this friendship group who was the sort of chairwoman. At the end of the session, she said, this time last week we were back at home, uh, but we've had such a good time this week that we're still here. So she's very blunt about it, but actually what she was saying was, we've had a good time, you have engaged us, you know, you've connected with us. So so what we wanted to do was to think of how we could develop that, and we'll say a little bit more about that. But for this project, Mind, Body, Spirit, we also used uh, collections uh, to reframe collections, to think about collections in different ways. We worked with Nottingham Museums, who had developed a project called Live Today, Think Tomorrow, that was about developing a set of resources to engage children and young people uh, to encourage them not to start smoking. And it was the not to start smoking that was the critical bit. Nottingham has incredibly high rates of uh, smoking. It's, um, there are several hotspots in the, in the UK. Bristol is another one as well. And perhaps it's not coincidental that there were cigarette factories in those places. You know? so, and one of the things that you got at Players with your pay package at the end of the week or the month was you got some extra free cigarettes. So there you were, you know, and you get bonus Christmas cigarettes and you get all sorts of things. Anyway, Nottingham Museums has got the most amazing um, archive and collection of material from players. It's absolutely incredible, including a series of um, posters and um, cigarette manufacturers like players spent a vast amount of money encouraging people. And I don't know if you remember, but in the 70s they um, uh, they advertised Formula One, you know, so it was this really sexy thing to go, and there's lots of uh, people, you can see somebody skiing there, so the whole idea of what smoking was like, and it, it's fantastic because the archive goes back to sort of the, the 1920s, and there's a lovely, beautiful 1920s image of a child uh, playing with their cig- father's cigarettes, daddy's little boy, you know, and you just... It, it's beyond comprehension now. They're so outrageous with our understanding of what uh, the impact of, of smoking cigarettes is. But how can we reframe those questions? How can we use them differently? And you'll see the original advert on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can see the doctored advert, which has got all the things that are in um, cigarettes. So things like benzene, arsenic, tar, all these awful cancerous elements to them but rather than like a health professional would go into a school and say to children you mustn't smoke because it does awful things to you it's terrible what this project did was to think very differently about how they might approach this Uh, and they wanted to work with a group of young people of peer mentors from a group called Fresh Futures. So what they did was work with this group of young people to develop resources that young people would be interested in. So they didn't preach to the young people and tell them, but they had incredibly frank discussions about cigarettes and smoking uh, and why you might start, why it's not, why it's not a good thing. There are all sorts of things I never knew about smoking. <laughs> Um, and there's a, a smoke-free Nottingham officer who knows absolutely everything. So she was brilliant at working in partnership to develop those resources with the young people. But the young people would absolutely listen. They produced a film, and the film was used with um, youth groups and community groups in the city. And it, it's part of that process of trying to think of how can you use those collections in new ways. <coughs> and their slogan was No Pressure. So the idea was to get young people to make an informed decision using debate, using discussion, using personal experiences to relate to young people. Very, very different from the way in which health professionals might approach that. I'm going to move over to Kerry now to talk about evidence. One of the um, 
key things to health and wellbeing work is capturing evidence of how these museum activities impact on people and impact particularly on their health and wellbeing. It's critical to demonstrate the value and um, show that impact particularly um, to the public health sector who are used to very rigorous scientific methods that use such things as control groups and experimental research um, which is the gold standard um, in research um, to demonstrate a, a cause and effect really so the, the aim in, in a lot of research is to try and show that this particular intervention is having this direct impact on health and wellbeing. The evidence can also help museums in other ways to help improve practice, see what was done and, and how it can be improved, and also um, get more funding as well for similar projects. It also shows who, what works, in what circumstances, and what the value and, um, um, of that activity is for people and also for the wider community. So talking about um, rigorous evidence, in Mind, Body, Spirit, um, we collaborated with the University College London, who at the time were developing um, a wellbeing toolkit to help museums um, capture evidence of positive impact on health and wellbeing. One of the key um, elements of this toolkit is the generic wellbeing umbrella, which I'm going to pass around a, a copy so you can have a closer look at it as well. It's also on the, on the screen here. And what this does is at the beginning of a session around in a, in a museum, you ask people to complete an umbrella to rate how they feel against a particular um, feeling. So we've got such things as, be, do you feel enthusiastic? Do you feel excited? Do you feel happy? Do you feel inspired? Um, and then once they've been through the session, they would then at the end rate how they felt against um, those feelings again. Um, and this is one that's been developed. There's also a blank one for people to fill in their own feelings if they want to. And also there's a negative one for people who, who might be in hospital or who, who feel quite negative about their health and well-being so they can say that they feel better um, as well. So these have been developed from the psychology sector who use similar things in their research um, and it uses statistical analysis so you can compare and contrast how people feel at the start and the beginning. Um, and um, we use these with, um, with the older people in the projects with the smaller museums and it was really interesting because at the, at the time UCL were developing a pilot project where they were collecting these um, health <coughs> and wellbeing umbrellas from across the UK so we were able to feed our data into that project which was really exciting and the older people in Leicestershire actually were the most happy out of everybody in the UK in the projects that had taken part their happiness significantly improved across the, the sessions they took part in um, so that was really good for mind, body, spirit really validated what we were trying to do with um, encountering the unexpected um, there's lots of other methods as well um, qualitative methods including interviews um, focus groups and they're sort of more in depth trying to capture um, how those museum sessions sort of um, influence people's everyday lives as well what do people take away from them how does it help um, improve their well-being more generally how does it fit in with measures that they take themselves to improve their well-being yes yeah, so there's so many exciting avenues that research can take it's, it's a really interesting area to work in um, i'm going to hand back to jocelyn now to talk about one of our new projects that we're developing thanks kerry um, and so the, the, capturing that data is massively important and uh, being able to put it in with bigger data sets is really significant as well and it's interesting that people can look at those and think oh my god they're incredibly simplistic actually uh, those simple, sim apparent simplicity is based around a huge amount of research a vast amount of research and what, what we found really useful about them was that people were happy to do it they didn't find it too invasive which is one of the major issues about asking people all the time and uh, I did one of these at one of the sessions and I felt I must admit at the beginning of it I didn't feel very active didn't feel very inspired happy or any of those things I felt pretty mediocre about all of them and it was the, the brilliant group in Lincolnshire and by the end of it I felt really inspired <laughs> really enthusiastic um, so I think it's interesting and the sort of we we changed those when we worked with the young people so they were slightly um, different uh, range that we looked at but they were very very vulnerable young people who were um, in the hospital school in Leicester so uh, but still as Kerry says we got very very positive responses 
Mind, Body and Spirit was a really important project for us. Um, there were lots of things about it that uh, gave us insights into the significance. But one of the projects within it which felt unresolved to us and something that we wanted to develop more was the notion of thinking about how we could use collections to engage older people in a different way from reminiscence and to think about how they could be much more actively engaged. So we've developed a project which we've got funding for from the um, Museums Association Esme Fairburn Collections Fund <coughs> for a two-year project called Encountering the Unexpected. And this is absolutely about working with older people to try to... It's based on... The, the rationale behind it is that, that older people need to stay actively engaged. And... I recently heard um, the older people's officer from Commissioner for Northern Ireland speaking, and she said, until your very last breath. And I just thought, you know, that's absolutely how I aspire to live. That's what I want to do. I want to live that so I'm connected and engaged with things. There's, there's a real sense that the way in which we think about age, I think in this country especially, is in a very negative form, very negative way of thinking about um, of, of, of old age, really. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But what we want to do with this is to think about how we can use new ways of collection, new, you, sorry, use collections in new ways to engage older people so that we can support health and well-being, but we don't focus on memory. It's actively using, trying not to use memory, so it's absolutely trying not to do that. And as part of that, we're collaborating with a group of natural history museums in the Northwest, which is um, Henry McGee, who's Keeper of Science at the Manchester Museum, is the lead on that. And he's absolutely inspiring about the potential of natural heritage collections. So for us, this is quite different. It's quite different territory for us to go and look at collections of that kind. Um, but I think there's a huge rationale behind it. So Kerry's going to say a little bit about Seven Million Wonders, which is the research they've done. So this is the inspiration behind um, using natural heritage collections. Um, as Jocelyn says, Henry McGee and the um, Natural History Museum <coughs> partnership in the Northwest have produced this really um, inspiring document, Seven Million Wonders. It talks about how natural heritage collections are packed with millions of wonders that can intrigue, surprise and fascinate. How can we unlock these treasures in natural history collections to support older people to age successfully, to remain actively engaged and also to be curious and to keep learning? So what we want to do is use these natural heritage collections to create meaningful, rich and stimulating encounters for example, how can we use these collections to engage older people with the natural world, to think about um, how the natural world is changing, how climate change might be happening, all those kinds of things. How can we help stimulate their concern to um, keep them thinking in the present and the future, to use their experiences from their long lives um, to help us think about how we can find solutions to um, problems for the natural world in the future? Also, there's a sense that natural history collections could be used more, um, that we can support natural history curators to find ambitious new uses, meaning and relevance for their collection that they might not have thought about before. Um, in particular, there's a real sense that having tactile connections, that engaging with natural history specimens on a first-hand direct basis can help to spark new thoughts, ideas and feelings and also awaken new interests and the search for meaning amongst older people as well. So Seven Million Wonders talks about how nature and well-being are a unique and irreplaceable resource for understanding and appreciating the world around us and it's this really interesting link between nature and well-being that we want to um, investigate as well. There's lots of evidence that suggests that connecting with nature, looking at birds in your garden, um, being on new walk with the trees and the plants around you, it can help to restore your physical energy, it can reduce stress it can generate a positive mood, and it can also help to improve your general outlook on life. However, there's also evidence to suggest that older people are much more disconnected from the natural world than younger people um, might be. They have less regular contact with nature, and they also 
do not benefit from its, effect, from its effects as much as other people. So how can we encourage older people to reconnect with the natural world and to see the, that nature is all around them, not just um, going to a park or going to a mountain, that it's in the everyday as well. So it's really interesting as well, Seven Million Wonders sort of locates the um, natural history collections firmly in that they're really used well with families and children, in fact they're most strongly associated with children and their families and, not, and do not tend to be used with older people. So we want, in this project we want to activate their use for older people um, and to think about how natural history collections aren't just you know, used with children to stimulate interest in nature, but how they can be then used across the whole life course. How can we keep stimulating that interest and curiosity um, with natural history? And also, thinking about how can we connect that interest with the wider world, as I say, to think about wider issues around climate change, around how nature is changing, um, the, clim you know, the seasons seem to be changing, what, what sense can we make out of that? Um, and also to get older people thinking about the present and the future. So once I've sorted this out, I'm going to hand back to Jocelyn, who's going Thanks. to talk a bit more about active and successful ageing. Um, there's a lovely example from one of the partners we're working with from the RSPB um, who talked about um, an older person. He put, put out some bird feeders in communal gardens and an old guy in the same block of flats of him as him just said, you've transformed my life. And he's saying, what? Don't you know what you're talking? He said, because I now see all these birds coming. So it's attracting those. It's that sense of life, that sense of connection. And I think we often underestimate how small um, actions can be, but the significance it can have on people's lives. So massively significant. So why is it so important? What's this sort of issue of active ageing? Well, it's, it's increasingly recognised that how we age matters. To age successfully, older people need to remain actively engaged in the world. Many older people struggle to find meaning and purpose in a society that sees ageing as a process of decline and burden. A negative experience of ageing is also a social justice issue, as older people's rights are not as well developed in comparison with other people's groups. Successful ageing is the positive experience and perception of the ageing um, uh, process associated with active engagement with life, continued social participation and a sense of meaning and purpose. So it's absolutely about people having a sense of self-worth, a sense of autonomy, um, of keeping learning, of keeping engaged. And what we want to do with this is to ask the question, can natural heritage collections support natural ageing? Um, what are the opportunities and the challenges of using these? And having worked and begun my museum career in museum education, I'm all too aware of the thousands of stuff specimens there are in collections, which I think are used in very mediocre ways often. You no, know, they're very limited in the way in which they're used, and I think the potential for them is, is vast. So how resilient can older people, how, you know, can, how can they be when they grow old? The more resilient we are, the more we're able to, to cope with change. And the one thing we know about everybody's lives, that change will inevitably happen. And that will happen both on a global level and a personal level as well. So developing that sense of resilience is hugely important. Thanks. Um, encountering the unexpected will create a framework or a set of principles that will help museums to interrogate natural heritage collections. We've got a brilliant partnership with a whole range of different partners, um, people like Equal Arts from the northeast of England who've done projects called the Hen Project where they've worked with older people to raise hens and connect with the, the development of those, brilliant, absolutely brilliant project. The Eden Project, we've got a whole host of different people as well as a big network of museums and we absolutely want to think of new ways in which we're able to do this. Let's just very briefly end by thinking about what the perceptions of ageing are, because it's also about us trying to challenge society as well. Critical to the project is museums engaging with older people and empowering them so they become active and engaged citizens. Society has very fixed, very negative views of older people and ageing. 
what they're interested in, how they should behave, um, how long they should work, what they should wear, what they should be interested in. You can see those beige jackets, can't you? Museums are challenging society's perceptions of older people and the way in which they can prevent older people um, from, so they can actually ensure that older people can reach their full potential. To see older people not as an age problem, not as the dementia time bomb, but as a group of interesting individuals with life experiences, with interesting stories to tell, with a sense of humour, with a continued stake in society, for now and for the future, because they are interested in the future as well. It may not be directly their future, but it's people connected with them or society's future. Okay. Um, at the same time, we've um, become involved in the development of an evaluation of Northern Mu National Museum Northern Ireland's big, fund big lottery funded projects, so a bit of a tongue tie, accelerating ideas, live and learn. Um, this is the development of a six year programme that's been run by National Museums Northern Ireland, also funded by the big lottery, that has worked with disadvantaged older people who don't normally visit museums. So it engages them on a six, normally a six week programme where they go into a museum or take part in workshops in the community. They can choose um, the theme of, of the, of the um, activity they want to do, but it's normally based around the museum collections and um, it normally involves making something as well. So they've got something tangible to take home with them. But it engages them in a social way, they work together in groups, um, they take part in art activities, in creative activities. Um, and the idea is to keep them learning, to encourage their creativity, to promote mental and physical health and well-being, and to help individuals to reach their full potential. So you can see some of the aims there are really similar to encountering the expected, that stress on active um, and successful ageing, keeping people engaged and keeping them interested in doing things. So at the moment this project is still in development. Um, National Museums Northern Ireland have been invited by Big Lottery to develop, live and learn further by replicating it in another location. So they've partnered up with um, Tyne and Weir Museums and Archives um, who have a, also have a really long established track record in working with communities and working around health and wellbeing. Um, so they want to see if, if the project can be replicated and, you know, and take it further and develop it so it's um, including more people and also including better outcomes. Um, the, the museums are still waiting to hear if it's been funded, but if it is funded, um, RCMG will be involved and will be doing an evaluation of the project across the two museum services, capturing evidence of how it works, of how it um, supports active um, and successful ageing, and also learning outcomes for older people. Um, and this time we're also going to think about using um, methods that can demonstrate cause and causality directly. So thinking about using control groups and what that can show us. So comparing people who have taken part in the programme with people who haven't taken part in the programme and how their well-being is affected and to see if the museum intervention has a real positive effect on, on how they feel about um, their well-being and their health. So that would be really exciting because not much research like that has been done in museums at the moment. So it's a real chance to, to think about how we can make this possible um, and also collect some really innovative evidence. So that's the, the three projects. So just to conclude... Um, RCMG are finding that museums can make a real difference to health and wellbeing and it's really exciting taking part in these projects, collecting the evidence, talking to people and getting their views on how they feel really stimulated and energised by these museum projects. It's very exciting. Um, it also shows that museums can use their collections in very diverse ways and that there's no one type of collection that is useful to health and well-being. I mean, Mind, Body, Spirit use so many different types of collections. We had social history collections, um, now I'm going to forget what they are, world collections with New York Museum, lots of different, the John Player um, cigarettes archive, really different collections with different purposes can be used to help promote positive health and well-being. Size of museum didn't matter, capacity of museum, we work with big museum services and also with small volunteer run museums um, who were able to take part and use their collections in new ways and were really keen to do so as well. 
but there's one thing that, and I find it really interesting when we did the, the MOOC the first time um, there were a lot of negative comments about, from people saying how um, a lot of this health and wellbeing work has nothing to do with museums we don't use museum collections it's all about social care it should be done by other agencies but we can say on the basis of our projects that collections are essential to these projects museums collection, collections are integral to this work and it's what they are what gives that positive health and wellbeing the tactile connections the people talking about them engaging them in new ways and thinking in new ways they're really important to that work and lastly, just to say again that how critical evaluation is to collect evidence of the value of this work and demonstrate it not just to museums themselves, but also to funders, to policy makers, to social care agencies, to public health agencies, who are also beginning to really understand how important museums are for health and wellbeing and culture itself and the powerful impact that that can have on people. Um, it's a really exciting time to be in museums at the moment, I think.